want to invite you to open up to the book of Nehemiah in the Old Testament. And as you're turning there, um, tell you a little bit of story when I was 20 years old. Yeah, I know that was in the previous century. Maybe more than one. Uh, I was riding a motorcycle that still needed to be tuned up. You know, this is back before, you know, electronic fuel injection or electronic ignition. So there were mechanical things that had to be changed, like points, spark plugs, things like that. So I was going to do a quick tune-up on my motorcycle because that was my transportation and, and then ride back home to California. I was living in a little tiny town called Alta Loma, Texas. Uh, my address was M and a half <laughs> in Alta Loma. And I was 20 years old. I'm getting ready to tune up my bike. And so I'm just going to, you know, change the points and the spark plugs and the oil. And then the next day, get on the road, you know, early in the morning and ride back to California. 2,200-mile ride. So I'm starting the process, which means I, I have to adjust the cam chain tensioning bolt. So I back off the lock nut to loosen the, the bolt so the cam chain can adjust itself. And then I can start the process. And as I loosen the lock nut for this bolt, it falls off in my hand the whole big half of the bolt. Now, if you're a mechanic, you know, ooh, that's not supposed to happen. And so what had happened was the year before, the motorcycle dealer in Sacramento called Carmichael Honda had a mechanic that tuned up my bike and charged me good money for that, and he broke that bolt. But instead of telling me, he actually just tightened it back down with a lock nut holding it in place. And so he never told me that he broke it. So I, all I did was back off the, lock, the locking nut, and the whole thing fell off in my hand. So now I need to take the engine out of the frame and dismantle the entire engine to take one part of the engine case to an aircraft machine shop in Houston, Texas, near the airport, and have them punch out the aluminum and tap in new threads and make me a new tapered bolt in a bigger size and then, so I, then I could rebuild my motor and put it back in the frame and ride my motorcycle home. So my simple one hour job now became a seven day job of working about 18 hours a day. And here's the point of my story. I needed help. I'm not a mechanic. I had like three tools. You know what I'm saying? And you can't rebuild a motor with three tools. I needed a torque wrench. I needed a full set of sockets. I, need, I needed all this stuff. So different men who were neighbors, I knocked on their doors and, and they lent me tools. You know, one guy lent me a torque wrench. Another guy lent me a, a socket set. So guys let me borrow their tools for this week. Uh, my neighbor across the street let me use their garage so I could take my engine out and literally lay all the parts of my engine on their garage floor on newspaper for a week. I took over their garage, and they were happy to let me do this. So I had many hands help me, and I needed the help. One of my other neighbors lent me their car so I could actually drive to the Honda dealer for parts because it was in another city, and I couldn't walk there. So I had many people help me that week. If I did not get that help, I'd probably be still stuck in Alta Loma in M and a half because there's no way I was going to walk back home to, to Sacramento. So I appreciate those hands that helped me. I still remember every single one of those people. It wasn't just one person. It was many people that helped me. And I needed that help. Now, most of us don't think of ourselves as helpless most of the time. As a matter of fact, most of the time we like to think that we're the type of people that can help others, right? We don't need help, you know? Well, the truth of the matter is, every single one of us need help. Sometimes it's more obvious. And Jesus came to help us first. He came to seek and save the lost. He came to show us the love of God, amen? And Jesus did that personally. He came to us not just when we needed help, but when we were his active enemies. That's when Jesus came to us. Each one of us, Jesus came to. Nehemiah came to the city of Jerusalem, to God's people, 
who had been punished by God for their sins, which were many, and they were suffering, and Nehemiah came to them. And this is what the book of Nehemiah says. It's in your notes. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 10. Someone, Nehemiah, had come to seek the welfare of the sons of Israel. As we begin this morning, I want to make one simple point and then get into this text. You and I are here because Jesus loves us personally. That's first. And in this loving relationship we have with the living, awesome God, he's called us in Christ to be his hands here in Sacramento. We're to be the hands of Jesus, reaching out to people that need desperately his love and need in some way his help or physical help of some kind. And all of us at a very simple human level understand what that means to receive help when you need it. We've all been there. I was there when I was 20 years old with my broken motorcycle. And many times since then, I've been there needing help. And so have you. I'm sure you could think of a time fairly recently you needed help. And other people came to help you. We are here in Jesus' name, in the power of the Holy Spirit, with the gospel of Jesus, to help the people of Sacramento. This is why we're here. We're not here for ourselves. You're not in this worship service to be entertained. We're not here for ourselves. We are here to be the hands of Jesus, making an eternal difference in Sacramento, bringing the gospel of Jesus to people that don't have it, especially the children, and I hope you realize this is our priority as people. Our priority is to reach our neighbors, especially the children, with the gospel of Jesus. And our, our priority is going to be to live three ways. This isn't the book of Nehemiah, but this is the entire word of God. Our first priority is to love God and abide in him. Amen? Our third priority. Notice I went to number three. I, I know my math. I know where two is. Number three is we are to bear witness. Give testimony. Share the good news of Jesus with people. Share the word of God with people. But that second priority carries everything else. It carries the first two. It's how we live our lives daily. It's how our hands make a difference that impacts lives forever. And it is loving one another. Loving one one another. That's our second priority. Loving God by abiding in Jesus, loving one another and bearing witness to Jesus. Those are our three priorities. And so we talk about hands that help. Hands that help need to be motivated and moved by the love of God released through us. It's not our affection for strangers that makes a difference because honestly, how many strange people do you have any affection for? I mean, most of the time, strange people we want to get away from, right? We don't want to draw close to them in love. So what is our motivation? What is the power that moves our hands to make an eternal difference in people's lives? It's the love of Jesus. That's it. And so when we look at Nehemiah and his example of seeking the welfare of the sons of Israel, this needs to be said of us today. We need to be motivated by the Holy Spirit and the Word of God through the love of Jesus so that our hands make an eternal difference here in Sacramento, seeking the welfare of the sons and daughters of Sacramento. You, you just got the whole conclusion of the message right there. So what did, what did Nehemiah do? What did he put his hands to that, that made a big deal, that made a difference I'm going to give you a whole summary of the book here. Rapid fire. And this is, this is the whole work of Nehemiah. This is his life summed up in just a few words. Well, in chapter 3 through 6, literally in those three chapters of the book of Nehemiah, he rebuilt, he worked with the people to rebuild the ruined and burnt walls of the city. 
If you look at pictures of Israel today, or not just Israel, if you look at pictures of Jerusalem today, there's all kinds of walls around old, original Jerusalem. And some of the stones are obviously different than other stones because the wall's been rebuilt more than once. So you can see the, the ancient stones and the, the older stones and the newest stones all laid on top of each other. Because in the old days, they didn't have, you know, aircraft and radar. They had city walls that protected them, and that's it. And so the, the people of God built these walls to help protect the innocent people, the children of the city. Then you and I need to, to raise up protections and works that will save people's lives and protect children today. We need to rebuild walls for Sacramento, especially the children. They are at risk in many ways. Nehemiah's next work was encouraging the tired and fearful people in chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. When I saw their fear, I rose and spoke to the nobles, to the officials, and the rest of the people. This is everybody, folks. Do not be afraid of them. That is the group of people that was seeking to attack them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome. And fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. Little motivation there. So he encouraged them. He saw their fear and he encouraged them. And we need to be encouragers of the people around us. Are there things to be afraid of today? A few. And they're serious. We are to be encouragers that point people to God. Look at God. Look at the things God has done from the beginning of time up till now. God is at work. Yeah, there's gloom and doom in the newspaper and in the evening news, in the morning news. Every day there's bad news, right? But God is working and God is saving and God is healing. God is forgiving. So point people to God and encourage tired and fearful people. Nehemiah lifted economic burdens in chapter 5. The people of God that were left in Jerusalem and left in Israel were like refugees. And over the course of 70 years, an economy developed and the smart people took advantage of the not so smart people and the, the people that had a tiny bit of money took advantage of the people that had no money by you know, giving you know, money loans at, at exorbitant interest rates. And so all of this went on until the, the people, the majority of the people were left like slaves. And Nehemiah came in and said, look, all of this is against the word of God, which it was. And so he commanded them, go back to living the way God commanded you. Stop treating each other like slaves. Stop charging this exorbitant interest. Stop charging interest at all, because God forbid that Israeli people, Jewish people, children of Abraham could not charge each other interest. So he called them to a revival according to God's word that dealt with their wallets. Now, I actually thought about this, and I didn't know how you'd respond, but I'm going to show you what I'm thinking. I'm going to take my wallet out, and I'm going to just hold it up. This is my wallet. In it are cards and money, like most wallets. And most of us don't think of our wallets as holy. You ever take your wallet out and go, ooh, that's an awesome work of God right there. <laughs> most of us pull our wallets out and go, ooh, that's a thin amount of money right there. And... We don't think anything of it. It's just a normal thing we all carry around. You know, it's got our IDs and cards so we can buy gasoline and milk in the store and stuff like that. But this is actually a holy instrument. This is representing, in a very physical form, the resources God has entrusted to me to use for his glory and to use to be a blessing to other people. It's up to me how I use them. I can use the resources God has entrusted to me to be a blessing for others, or I can use the resources God gives me for my own fun, for my own pleasure. I can make the world all about me, or I can make the world about Jesus and his kingdom, right? And, and what I do with my wallet and my resources shows where my heart is. And, and most of you are remembering that verse that Jesus spoke, aren't you? Your heart will be where your treasure is. Your treasure will be where your heart is. So is your wallet something holy in the hands of Jesus? It's a good question, isn't it? 
Nehemiah put his money where his heart was in Christ, in God. And he lifted the economic burden of the people. And he actually used his own money to bless the people. In chapter 6, we see that he obeyed the word of God and he prayed and he resisted compromise. This is something that sneaks up on every one of us. Compromise never comes at you as a full frontal attack. It always sneaks up from behind you, comes alongside you, and entices you in little ways. Oh, you can sleep in five more minutes. You don't need to get up and pray. You know, most of us recognize compromise when it comes to something that we're used to physically, like a diet. Most of you know if, if you're on a diet, donuts aren't usually included. But you'll, you'll let that little enticement, you know, whisper near that, oh, just one won't hurt. Right? But that's how compromise starts. It's just that one nibble. That's the compromise. What do you think the fish feels when the hook is set in its mouth when it just took that one nibble? Do you ever find yourself with the hook in your mouth being pulled up out of the lake that you were swimming in thinking to yourself, I should not have taken that nibble? <laughs> That's compromise. And it's in any little part of our life, whether it's our eating habits or our financial habits or our relationship habits, our personal computer habits, any compromise gives Satan the hook to nab you. And people came along Nehemiah. People, human beings, and they tried to entice him to compromise. One guy came along, Nehemiah, and said, Oh, Nehemiah, there's these guys, and they have this, they've got a, a conspiracy to kill you, and they're going to sneak up in the middle of the night, and they're going to stab you to death. And, and so Nehemiah resisted the temptation to just, you know, Oh, I, I better go run and hide, you know. He said, No, but I'm trusting God. And the guy said, No, 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 you don't understand. They're, gonna, they're really going to attack you. They're going to murder you. And so you need to go hide in the temple which only the high priest was allowed to go into, Nehemiah said, I'm not going to break God's laws. I'm not going to defile myself in God's holy temple to save my own skin. I'm going to trust God. So he resisted the conspiracy. He resisted the personal attacks because there were men trying to kill him. That was real. And he resisted the compromise of trying to protect his self, his being, versus the holiness of God. Which one will you fight to protect more? The holiness of God and how you live or your own personal skin? Most of us want to protect our skin first, right? Nehemiah put God's holiness first and God blessed him. So resisting compromise comes in all forms, but it's always blessed by God. So resist compromise like Nehemiah. And then Nehemiah did something different that, you know, most people don't think to do. He actually counted all the people and took a census. And according to the word of God, when God's people took a census, they had to then give an offering to the support of the temple or the tabernacle. And they did. You don't understand how awesome this is. They obeyed the word of God. David took a census without taking the offering, and God sent a plague on the people. Nehemiah took a census and took the offering, and God blessed the people. Obedience brings blessing, even in something as simple as giving God an offering. And when they gave God the offering, it went to something specific. It went to the support of the priests and the Levites and taking care of the temple. So God blessed them. And then he provided a public reading of God's word in chapter 8. He actually had Ezra stand at a pulpit in a square in the city. And he read God's word in Hebrew 
which most of them did not know because they had been slaves in a foreign land and only recently sent back to Israel. And so they grew up learning Babylon or Babylonian or whatever the language was that they spoke, Ugaritic, whatever. And they learned something different. And so they actually had to have translators translate Hebrew into the language they heard so that they could then learn Hebrew and learn the word of God. And it caused a revival in the nation. They read the word of God and that began an actual revival of the people of God. Read God's word. It can't be more simple. If you want to walk with God more intimately, read God's word. And don't just expect me to be the only one reading it to you. Because I'm not going to show up at your bedside tomorrow morning at 530 in the morning. And you're going, thank you. <laughs> to read to you God's word. We are not to be children anymore, are we? We're to be mature in Christ, which means that we have to feed ourselves. And the, and the word of God is to be meat and, and nourishment. And, and it's to be life itself. It's the bread of life to us. So we need to take in the word of God and it will change our lives. And then chapter 8, he ordered after uh, the beginning of the revival had broke out, he ordered a feast and a celebration. How many of you like to party? Woohoo! Yes, let's party in Christ. He ordered a feast and a celebration, and they celebrated for the first time in probably more than 70 years the Feast of Booths, which went back to the story of the people leaving Egypt and going into the wilderness and living in tents for, well, more than 40 years, actually. But the Feast of Booths was a joyous time for the entire nation. Chapter 9, he renewed the, people of, the people's covenant with God. Chapter 12, he held another major celebration and worship for the rededication of the wall of Jerusalem. So they held a special ceremony to just blow out the roof of the place with joy over God causing the entire wall to be rebuilt and finished, completed, job done. They set a world record. And, and you're just sitting there like, okay. <laughs> if you just were involved in, with your own hands, a miraculous work of rebuilding an entire city's walls, you'd be jumping up and down. You'd be feeling more secure. You'd be feeling a whole bunch more joy because God had brought the people together and they were enabled to do something together that they had not seen done in more than a generation. How would you feel? Literally, think about this. How would you feel if an earthquake and a fire came and the walls of our sanctuary were burnt down? We had no roof, no heating and air conditioning, and no walls. So we get together for worship next Sunday and we're outdoors the whole time. Okay, now number one, it'd be really hot, wouldn't it? Number two, be a little more distractions than, you know, the cars are driving by. No, it would not be the same, would it? How would you feel then as soon as we together with our own hands rebuilt the walls and rebuilt a roof and replaced the stained glass with our own hands? You'd feel some significant joy, wouldn't you? This is what God is calling us to personally in our community, because our community has some broken walls and broken roofs and needy people needing the security of the love of God. And it's our hands that are meant to rebuild and do this work and then celebrate. And I want to make one other point here. In chapter 12, it talks about the entire city got together to celebrate with amazing music and choirs, multiple choirs. How many of you like choirs? Woo, choirs are great. They had multiple choirs. They had choirs standing on this rooftop and choirs standing on this rooftop. They had stereo music going with choirs. And they had the loudest music. Now, personally, as I have gotten a little older, I can admit that, uh, I don't listen to music as loudly as I used to. But I still like it. Uh, but I think this would have even been loud by anybody's standards because they had all the loud instruments going at the same time. They didn't just have the soft harps going they had the horns blasting. They had the loud crashing cymbals going. They had all the music going. The whole symphony was playing. They were trying to blow the roof off the city. 
And they did a good job. They wanted God in heaven to hear their music. And so the entire city celebrated with loud celebratory music. So we, we don't always have to be, you know, really quiet and conservative in worship. Have you ever been to a symphony with loud crashing cymbals? And, you know, the, the timpani, you know what timpani is, those humongous drums, right, the kettle drums pounding those things. Uh, that's what God's people did to worship God. With beautiful music, I'm sure, but they busted loose with the with worship music. And so I think you and I can take a lesson here to praise God with a little more vibrant joy. And then he reformed the priesthood and Sabbath practices and marriage according to the word of God. I find that amazing that in an entire nation of God's people, he not only had to reform the priesthood, because even the priests were neglecting the word of God and going their own way and breaking the word of God and defiling the priesthood. So he reformed the priest, he reformed the practices of celebrating the Sabbath, and he reformed marriage. He got them back to the word of God. And does our society today, in Sacramento in particular, could, could they use an encouragement from the Word of God? Now, before I start pounding on the issue of marriage, which I'm not going to, he reformed the priests first. Now, what does God tell us in the Word of God about you and I today? The Word of God says today, you and I are priests of the Most High God. As a matter of fact, you and I in Christ are royal priests of the Most High God. So before God reforms our society and our marriage practices, who does he first want reformed? Yeah, you, you can just point, your, point at yourself. I, I really like that. There's somebody right here. Take your thumb just... It's right here. I need to reform myself, my heart, my mind, my practices before God can use my hands and my loving heart to reform our society according to the kingdom of God. I need to be a reformed priest myself. We don't set ourselves up as judges of society. We set ourselves to be servants in the love of God, but we have to be holy to be servants of the Most High God. So we can't be living our life our own way. We need to be living our life according to the living and holy and active and powerful Word of God. Amen? It's not our thoughts that matter. It's God's thoughts that matter. So how do we boil all this down? How do we actually get our hands involved in the work? It comes from a heart that lives the two great commandments. Our hands have to be motivated by loving God as central, the central reality of our life. In Deuteronomy 6.4, the people of God are, giving a, are given a command by God. And it literally says, love God first. Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is part of the Shema. This is part of a prayer that every faithful Jew prays every single day, beginning in verse 4, hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh is one, and you shall love Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And then you're supposed to teach these diligently to your children. In every action you take, not just by the words you say, but in all of your lifestyle, you are to teach your children to love God first. So are we living this? Are we living a passionate love for God in all that we are? And in our lifestyle, are we showing our children that loving God is the highest and greatest priority? That's two good questions, isn't it? Our entire lifestyle is to reveal the central power of the love of God in our life. That's number one. Number two, 
out of that central love of God is loving people. That is the natural fruit that grows from a life that loves God. In John 15, Isaiah 58, Matthew 25, and 1 John 3, God's Word tells us that love is not just a sentiment or a warm, fuzzy feeling. Real love are hands moved to action in concrete ways, even sacrificial ways, where you bless someone else to help them grow in their relationship with God, that you meet their need. And the story that Jesus gave of the Good Samaritan is the classic example of this. Because the Samaritan was the hero of the story, right? And the Samaritan is on a, on a road trip. He's a businessman on a road trip. Now, if you're a businessman on a road trip, do you have a lot of extra time? No. You've got deadlines. You've got appointments. You're going from one city to the next city, and they're waiting for you to show up on time, right? Business is no different then than it was today or is today. And so he's on a road trip. He's doing business. And he sees a guy dying in the gutter, dying in the dirt, bleeding because he's been robbed and beaten and he's near death. And he stops his schedule. He stops his agenda. He stops his life to help a man he doesn't know. A Samaritan helps a Jew, which in Jesus' day never happened. It would be today like a Palestinian in the Hamas organization stopping to help an Israeli soldier who was dying in the dirt. You know they don't think like that. But in Jesus, this is how we're to live. So we help even our enemy. And we love them. And we bless them. And we sacrifice our time and our money because that's what the Samaritan did. He took the dying man to an inn and he paid for his room and he paid for his care and he said, look, whatever this guy needs, give to him and I will pay you when I'm on my return trip. That's like handing the innkeeper your American Express card. Here you go, whatever you need. Spend this. How many of you would do that? I have never given a hotel key, you know, a manager my credit card to use for somebody else. I've never done that. But the Good Samaritan did. And the point is not that we're all supposed to run out to the nearest hotel and hand them our credit card. That's not the point. But the point is we live next to people that may be enemies. Cheryl and I had a neighbor last night. This is a true story. They had a party, I think for, we're guessing, probably a daughter that just graduated from high school, and they had a DJ that was so loud, I thought I was in a, a nightclub in New York City with the, the music pounding loud enough to knock the stained glass out of the windows. This is in the backyard not in the house. So not only could you hear it inside our house like we were in the backyard with them, but my neighbors across my street, now these are the neighbors behind me, the neighbors across my street heard it as loud. I mean, you could hear it, I think, three miles away. This went on all night. My wife's correcting me. It didn't go on all night. <laughs> It went into 11. <laughs> Late enough. Okay, so with that, with that going on, do you think we were feeling warm, fuzzy feelings towards that neighbor? Mm -mm. But here's what God was doing, I think in me, and probably in Cheryl too, maybe mom because she was with us. How can I bless this neighbor to build a relationship with them? How can I bless this neighbor so that they will maybe come to Jesus and get a little more wisdom on how to treat their neighbors? I need to love them first before he'll listen to me, right? So how can I build this relationship? So I, I'm praying about that. I've, I've actually started praying about how I can build a relationship with this neighbor because 
God willing, I never want another night like that. But more importantly, all of our neighbors and all the people in our communities who are not walking with Jesus, and you and I know that's the majority, right? They need the love of God. They need the love of God. They need the word of God. They need Jesus. Reality, the reality of the living God. They need the reality of Jesus incarnate in their lives, in their homes, in their children. And you and I are the hands that Jesus has put here to make this work happen. The walls of Jerusalem did not just bounce up into the air and come down in place because Harry Potter waved a magic wand. Now, you can laugh about that, but don't you and I sometimes think, well, I'll just pray a prayer and it'll happen. And God says, well, you can pray that prayer, but I'm going to answer that prayer by using you to make it happen. He's put us here physically for this reason. God wants to use our hands to make a difference. What are we waiting for? Perhaps, like the priests in the city of Jerusalem, we're just waiting to be reformed, for the Spirit of God to awaken us internally so that we will walk in the newness of life, so that we'll walk in holiness with our holy God, and so that His love and His power can then be released in us. Amen? We need to seek the welfare of the sons of Sacramento. And it's our hands that God is calling to this work. As our worship team comes back up uh, to lead us in a final song, I want to invite you to stand and lift your hands to God however you want. I know some of you can't lift your hands because you have a bad shoulder. That's okay. Just lift your hands any way you can. Over your head, in front of you, however you're comfortable. Just lift your hands to God. And let's dedicate our hands to this work. Okay, let's pray. Jesus, when you restored Peter, in John 21, you told him to keep his eyes on you and do the work of taking care of the lambs. So, Lord, I, I pray to, for all of us now, for myself and all of us, that you and your Holy Spirit and your word will renew us and revive us from our hearts and minds outwardly through all of our lifestyles. And that then you will take our hands and use us for the good work to seek the welfare of the sons and daughters of Sacramento. Lord, open our eyes to see the people around us as you see them. And then move us, Lord, in your holiness and in our obedience and faith in you to put our hands to the work of reaching them with your love and your gospel. Lord, use us for your glory and your kingdom and for their blessing. Amen.